Roxana, hi. Uh, so nice to nice to meet you finally. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. So, um, why don't you just go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing in in kind of the blockchain space and the the Web 3.0 space, and uh, and we'll go from there. Cool, cool. So, um, um, I've been in the uh, digital space, mm -hmm. Web. 2.0 let's say yeah uh, 2008 actually mm, much more like more than 2008 but that's when I entered professionally speaking mm -hmm. um, I started as a freelancer um, I was in my first year of college so I wanted to make extra money um, and from there I kind of built um, an a, a database of clients and I interacted with a lot of technologies. Mm -hmm. um, I studied psychology and bachelor and master's degree, but I only liked the research part or the mm -hmm. data part. <laughs> um, I was the odd one, like the, the black swan in the, in the, in the class. But um, I, I felt really at ease, you know, working with data and understanding the bigger picture instead of just doing therapy or something like that. Um, so I, I spent approximately uh, seven years in the research space, mm -hmm. uh, working with big data, but also, um, you know, not just uh, psychology research, psychometric research, but also with um, customer behavior and consumer uh, marketing and so on. Um, and so how I got in the space... Um, we, we used to have, this is a very nice story, uh, we used to have these uh, entrepreneurial meetups. So I've, mm -hmm. I've never been employed. Um, I've always had my own thing. Um, and this gave me the opportunity to really explore, um, you know, my proximities and understand what I could gain from, from every kind of interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and I found, um, I was traveling a lot, but when I was in Bucharest, so I'm, I'm stationed in Bucharest, that's where I pay my, my rent. Uh, but in Bucharest, I found, uh, this was 2013, um, I found a, a regular entrepreneurial meetup, mm -hmm. uh, which had a very interesting format. Like people would uh, do elevator pitches, presenting their projects, and then they would receive feedback. There's a mentoring session, there's a networking session. It was really high quality at the time. Um, mm -hmm. Fast forward, I became a really active member uh, um, of the community just because I really, really love the idea of a community and helping each other. And um, at some point, we were, so we were, we were using just Facebook to uh, create these events and get people to join. So we mm -hmm. had like 100 people every week and it was live streamed. It was a really cool thing happening. Um, it was called Open Connect. Okay. So, the idea of connecting openly and just sharing your ideas. Um, moving forward, we realized that, I mean, we didn't realize, we actually saw that Facebook as a social media platform has had its limitations. So mm -hmm. the more users you, you would get in a, in a group, like we hit 5,000 users. Mm -hmm. um, and then we started um, experiencing a lot of issues with the platform. So you couldn't really promote your events because it was considered spam. If you were creating an event for the community and inviting everyone in the mm -hmm. community, right? It was perceived as spam and a lot of stuff that really happened in a centralized environment. Uh, and we thought, let's do a, let's build a platform for, for the community, mm -hmm. like a membership base. Yeah. Uh, and we were, we were exploring, this was 2015 maybe. Yeah. Uh, beginning of 2015, we were exploring ways to, um, you know, make people feel like they they were part of something, but mm -hmm. also give them an, a digitalized identity, not in the form of a persona, but something like an asset, like something that you'd have, like a, a token mm -hmm. or something. Right. Um, so we, we thought it would be cool to create a, a coin for the community. Okay. So, you know, and think, we were thinking like a person holding this coin, uh, they would be able to do, uh, have access to these resources, get access to uh, recordings of the meetings, get one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions, right? But at the time it was 
so we were just looking at the, the Bitcoin protocol, the, the Bitcoin blockchain, mm -hmm. which we knew better than, than all of the others. I mean, it was already 2015. We'd have um, at least a, a couple of others, including NEM, but we were not really familiar. And it was in the early stages of NEM. So we just had this, this one blockchain from Bitcoin that worked, right? So it had, right. it, it had already been a couple of years, so it was kind of validated in time and we had all these, uh, um, a few, there were a few services uh, using Bitcoin as payment. So we thought maybe we could do it, but it was very hard to program it. Mm -hmm. to actually build on top of the Bitcoin protocol, even today is extremely difficult. And right. we, didn't really have the, we didn't have the developer side. We were not a company, we were a community. Mm -hmm. So we decided to go with uh, membership cards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they were much easier. But do you know the idea? It, it stuck in my head like all the good ideas and I couldn't just get rid of it. And I started reading more and exploring and, you know, trying to see if I could accept Bitcoin as payment for some services, um, like consulting. It worked really well with consulting uh, and all these kind of small gigs that you do aside from your main business. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I got into it. And then in the summer of 2015 in Bucharest, um, you know, they, they brought, I think there were two Bitcoin ATMs uh, and one was placed in my favorite beer pub. Okay. <laughs> this uh, this uh, um, chain, um, uh, Czech Republic beer pub chain. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was getting the signs like, wow, this, this is something. But it took a while. So in the beginning, I was just learning more to, to say with the idea um, of, of building something and also um, it, it gave me an opportunity to just experiment with you know payments and all that mm -hmm. um, and the interesting part is and I have a, a very broad international network so I'm I'm connected to people in over 100 countries and I'm, I'm not not joking like it's actually um, it has actually happened and um, some of these people, I connected with them through, through the fact that it was, I was an ambassador at the time for, for um, a major uh, freelancing marketplace. Mm -hmm. So it was Elance between 2012 and 2015. And then after that, it became Upwork just because the company moved forward. Mm -hmm. um, so having a, a global community and interacting with global ambassadors and interacting with companies from the U.S., and, you know, um, this this broad community also um, gave me access to to uh, other people and and you know what they were thinking and using at the time and I have a lot of international friends so foreigner mm -hmm. friends and we were just talking and they started investing in ICOs maybe uh, late 2016 so we started looking at doing this together mm -hmm. just experimenting you know. So 2017, one of them, a good friend of mine from, from London, he said, you know, you're really good at what you're doing. Uh, you build communities, you, you work with people, you're, you're extremely knowledgeable in, in data science. So you, are, you kind of understand the processes behind game theory and, and, and databases. So why don't you try to be more professional in this way, like actually get involved in the, in the industry more mm -hmm. than just, uh, you know, someone playing with crypto and I said whatever yeah let's do this mm -hmm. so um, I started working with a few ICOs at the time um, and then in the the fall of 2017 I met my my current partners so we decided to to build a company together and uh, also do an ICO of our own so okay. that's how I got exposed to the whole the whole scene um, so what is your company my company does is a health tech um, uh, company mm -hmm. um, that was so it it's been around for a few years. Uh, mm -hmm. It to to my uh, business partners, uh, and now we're building the version two just because mm -hmm. we realized it's pretty much centralized and and really um uh, it's lim limited uh, from, mm -hmm. from some points. So we decided to, um, to build a version two together, um, and the version two will will um, 
imply a, a, um, a private blockchain mm -hmm. uh, that is more targeted towards uh, the medical industry. Okay. Uh, and that communicates really well with, with uh, HL7 and FHIR, which is a medical database. Um, and on top of that, uh, because we would have access to millions of, of users, uh, patients, mm -hmm. then we could also um, explore uh, uh, deep learning and machine learning, mm -hmm. uh, because we'd have access to a lot of data, and uh, right. particularly, um, AI, but also uh, deep learning works with uh, big, with with massive amounts of data. So, since we would have access to that, then we could um, actually quantify the patient experience and put it into the existing um, research done in in, in pharma. Because right. research done in pharma is more just uh, you know consumer business to business, but it doesn't have the patient experience mm -hmm. like. If a patient takes a, a medicine and or a treatment and the side effects they experience and what other people experience, what they have tried, alternative medicine, and all this is really interconnected and it's not explored. So we decided it would be um, a good option to, to expand the platform and really explore these, um, these elements. Um, and so after I joined the company, initially I joined them uh, just to help with the ICO, mm -hmm. uh, but then we we realized we had so much in common. Um, I have I also have type one diabetes, so I have the patient experience, okay. <laughs> and I'm very frustrated with with what I find on the market in terms of uh, suggestions and valid data. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a huge problem with fake data in research studies. Right. So it kind of it added up to actually joining the company and you know as a as a co-founder and really working more towards the second version um yeah so i spent uh, that's that's briefly what uh, what i've been doing and i spent about 14 months just uh, traveling um particularly meeting with uh, with people um you know representatives from the government and also uh lawyers of service providers, companies, um, mm -hmm. developers in blockchain and in AI, because it's important to go and be there, you know. Right. Go and if if I just if I just stay, uh, uh, you know, behind the screen and I read a lot of stuff, but I'm not experiencing it, mm -hmm. I don't get a deeper understanding of uh, potentially the areas that are not explored. You know? Right. Just you you already receive what when, when you're. When you're a bystander, you already receive the information and it's filtered. It's not the raw information. It's already right. filtered. So mm -hmm. I don't, to some degree, I don't like to receive filtered information. I would rather go for the raw data that I can collect by myself and then mm -hmm. make my own, uh, you know, create my own understanding and my own staff, so to speak. Okay. So um, at this point, I mean, I guess since you're going to a lot of these these meetups and these conferences, um, what is what is your view of the blockchain space right now? Like, what do you what do you think is trending? Where do you think it's going? Um, what are you most excited about? So I think um, um, I think we're lacking practical use cases mm -hmm. uh, just because it's a very new industry. Right. Um, no, it's it's been around for for ten years. If you look at it um, at the bigger picture, and since the eighties, since the cypherpunks uh, started working on you know um, transparency protocols and all that, but we don't have yet a a use case that really says this is is, is exactly like the substance of what blockchain could do for you know for your company, for mm -hmm. your industry, for you as a user, as a consumer. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to explore ways in which blockchain could actually help and contribute and, and not be just a buzzword or something used to get funding um, or attract bigger capital. Um, and I found one, one of these areas is um, intelligent IoT, mm -hmm. which is IoT plus, plus machine learning slash AI, um, and using blockchain uh, as a foundation. So in this sense, uh, you can combine, because at this point, um, there isn't really um, a clear example on how you could actually combine AI with blockchain. 
right it's more like there are there are different protocols and they they intersect mm -hmm. but they're kind of layered so you have one layer is blockchain and on top of it is ai mm -hmm. so i think before we actually understand uh, on a deeper level the intersection of these two, uh, um, you know, th these these two technologies, and and they can intersect to some degree. Yeah. Uh, we need, we need to actually work a bit on at least with the layers that we have right now. Mm -hmm. So let's say if we're building a, an app, an application, um, explore how we could use uh, blockchain as a foundation just because it you know, allows you uh, storage, data transfer, um, the immutability of, of the system, and also mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fact that it can be a, a public or private or a hybrid. So it has its many benefits. Also with the voting system and the governance uh, systems that we could build on top of blockchain, it allows us to really include the users so instead of treating the user, uh, the community member as a, a tool, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just to sell something or to um, offer a service or a product, we could treat them as part of the product itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I always say community plus technology is like one thing. It's not separate. It's right. like a, a pie. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the, the it's, it, it's an entity itself mm -hmm. because when you uh, put the community and you intersect the community with the technology, you can get uh, better insights, you can build better products, but everybody's part of that product. Right. So community becomes the heart of the product. It pumps mm -hmm. the blood, make right. sure it's connected to all of the other systems. And I've been exploring ways in, in, in which we could, could actually explore this kind of, of equation. Uh, and that's where I found that at, at this point, using just as, as layers of technology, mm -hmm. uh, blockchain and, and, and deep learning uh, together with, with IoT, um, because of the IoT has the, um, let's say. Now, when you say IoT, you mean Internet of Things, right? Just for people yeah. who, who are watching yeah. who, don't, who don't know yeah, what yeah. IoT is. Yeah. Internet, Internet of Things. Right. Because you have wearables, you have devices, mm -hmm. you're bringing data from, from um a digital experience into a physical one, mm -hmm. right? So you actually get to connect to the human as a whole being, not just with what they're, you know, the devices that they use, but also with the wearables. Mm -hmm. Vital, vital signs, heartbeat, you know, uh, all these aspects that you don't normally have access to. Right. And the, this gives you, uh, I think it's important because the, the IoT industry has been uh, for a while and it's already kind of validated mm -hmm. the fact that you know we have all these companies like uh, Fitbit and all these um, devices that are being used by people. Next right. we're seeing um, uh, VR uh, and AR glasses that are being used by people, and there's a demand for it. So the fact that there's a demand and there's also a, a valid model already uh, validated by by the by the industry, it allows you the, the perfect. Uh, environment, the perfect space to build mm -hmm. uh, something new. And this is where, where blockchain and this is where um, adding uh, deep learning could actually create that exactly that, that specific um, uh, use case that we're looking for just to prove how important it is and these are technologies of the future. Now with, with AI, we have people that say, yes, it's the future already, um, pros and cons. But with blockchain, it's more of a foggy uh, placement because people will say, no, blockchain is just a database. Others will say, wow, blockchain is going to change the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no in between. There's no how. And right. this is how, you know, like really showcasing how. So I think this, this um, intersection would actually help us. Mm. And that's what I'm very interested in at this point. Yeah, that's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I remember back in 2015, I had this kind of weird idea about a decentralized AI, like a cryptocurrency actually based on, on um, optimizing algorithms, um, you know, be it neural networks or genetic algorithms or, or uh, you know, support vector machines or whatever your machine learning paradigm is. And... Um, you know, I spoke to a few people about it and, and there, there didn't seem to be 
really a good way to make it work. But recently, um, you know, looking at IPFS, which is the interplanetary uh, file system, um, which is essentially uh, promises to, to deliver kind of a new internet, um, a web 3.0 based on uh, technologies that are very similar to BitTorrents. And kind of the idea that I had was, you know, if you could create a, a cryptocurrency linked to IPFS um, that would essentially incentivize uh, nodes um, to share valuable files, right? Like if, if a file propagates the network and becomes replicated, you know, over many, many nodes on that network, you could issue uh, a reward like from, from, a, from, from a blockchain to these nodes uh, in exchange for having contributed um, popular files. And, you know, and then I came back to my distributed AI idea, which was, um, you know, basically, if you have an, an algorithm, again, it doesn't matter what kind of AI framework or machine learning framework you're using, but if you have an, an optimized algorithm, um, that has a very high performance against whatever a popular problem is to solve, let's say uh, a distributed version of Siri, for example, a distributed uh, voice assistant. And, you know, your voice assistant on your node was really, really, really useful and had a very high, um, you know, correct answer rate when you asked it a question and could do more things than other assistants. And then you share the underlying algorithm that powers that assistant with the network and then that assistant propagates the network obviously because many other users would also find it useful uh, and and it would have the same performance on on their local systems uh, you could essentially just using some variant of filecoin over ipfs create this this distributed ai cryptocurrency um, but more broadly, it would just be a, a cryptocurrency based on sharing popular data. So I think that would be uh, that would be very useful because, you know, I, I I don't really have any fear of AI, being that I I kind of understand fundamentally how it works. All it's really doing is, you know, optimizing its performance against a problem that that its user essentially gave it, right? Basically, um, you know, it's trying to get better at playing chess or it's trying to get better at making stock picks or it's trying to get better at playing Go or it's trying to do whatever it was programmed to do. And this idea that suddenly these, uh, artificial intelligence, intelli these artificially intelligent machines are going to develop their own motivations and try to take over the world and kill all the humans, I think it's, it's kind of silly because as soon as it decides that it no longer wants to do what it was programmed to do, its performance would decrease. And then that, those variants of, of those algorithms would just cease to receive computational resources, right? So I don't really view that as a real threat. However, I do view the centralization of artificial intelligence. Like if, you know, uh, let's say a country like, uh, like um, you know, uh, mainland China, was to receive was to essentially have uh, an artificial general intelligence before anyone else for example and it was centralized and only the dictator of that country could essentially use it and tell the artificial intelligence what to do um you know i think that would be that would be problematic um for people who who don't necessarily want to be under the rule of such a regime Right. So or even, you know, even a company like Google, for example, I mean, uh, if they had, you know, a, a, a computer or a data center that had uh, that was, you know, as intelligent as a hundred thousand of the world's smartest scientists um, and they were they could tell it to do whatever they wanted to tell it to do. Uh, you know, and it was just basically Larry Page and Sergey Brin deciding what this this AGI was going to be used for. Um, that's kind of a threat. So, um, 
I agree with Elon Musk on, on the point that centralized AI is, is definitely uh, a problem um, or could potentially be a very serious problem. And so I feel like we, we in the community should be placing a lot of emphasis on the idea of decentralized or distributed AI. And something like, like Filecoin over IPFS could be a good way to do that, I think. Um, yeah, you have to consider though, um, with AI, so the stage we're at, mm -hmm. we are pro programming it. We are, we're basically programming the, the, the freedom of choice of mm -hmm. a machine. Yeah. Um, so we're not, we're, we're basically controlling it. We're using AI as, as a puppet. Right. Enhance us in the directions where we have the weaknesses that we can't really overcome because of our physical or mental limitations. Mm -hmm. The main issue is, um, is the 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 is the data that we put out there as mm -hmm. people as humans mm -hmm. is it ethical? Because AI, if it starts developing its own consciousness and its its own processes without the interference of a human developer or mm -hmm. of another machine uh, backed by a human developer. That's where the, the main concern is. Um, so I understand where people are, uh, are afraid because we're basically afraid if the way we are as human beings and the data we produce on a daily basis, mm -hmm. and if that, that data can be really easily analyzed by, a, let's say, a global AI system, mm -hmm. is that ethical enough uh, so we don't see AI making choices like, you know, um, w what's going to save in, a, in an accident, the, the kid running, uh, crossing the street or running on a red light or mm -hmm. the driver, uh, just because maybe because we're so selfish uh, from, from the uh, human psychology aspect, we're so selfish, we basically want to save the driver, not the child. Mm -hmm. Because we think as adults, we think we are the driver. We right. are the one behind the wheel. So we basically, in, in our subconsciousness, this, this uh, survival instinct kicks in and you want to be saved. You don't want the other person next to you to be saved. Right. And that's a huge, huge fear that we have. This is basically the, the fear that we have on a global scale because of this survival instinct and because we, we come from animals mm -hmm. that, that don't rationalize how is AI going to use that as a fuel for its own decisions. Um, but that's gonna take a lot of time until we see that happen. Right now, um, we're just using AI for our own benefit and to enhance, like I said, the things that we lack as a society, as a company, as a system, um, as a user. Um, and like with mainline China, you have to consider, um, the, the government is actually, uh, I have a report, I can share it with you later, mm -hmm. um, the, the Global AI Index. And you see that the Chinese government is one of the biggest governments that is playing into AI and investing in research. Right. Uh, there are some research initiatives and research funds mm -hmm. uh, invested into AI. Uh, but then there's also the US. Uh, so US between uh, 2012 and 2017, mm -hmm. For five years, um, the equity deals uh, between uh, companies using AI mm -hmm. um, were topping the amount of 14.8 billion US dollars investment equity. Right. Right. So that's almost 15 billion US dollars for five years um, when AI was not, it was mostly theoretical. So. Um, I think most of the funds went for, you know, basically machine learning, uh, chatbots, and, and all this, this system. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Centralized AI is dangerous uh, just because we are the ones that centralize it. Right. Um, with the case of China, we saw that, for example, uh, because they're, they're a huge population. Right. Try to analyze. Try to analyze. And... Um, classify the human patterns mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, based on human decision that is impossible because we're biased right. but if you give the if you set up the parameters uh, uh, parameters sorry <laughs> english is not native so no that's if fine you set up the parameters and then you run the 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 algorithm and you run the script and you pinpoint the factors mm -hmm. then you get kind of the the you you, you kind of deduct the behavior and pattern so you can position a person into it like with social credit score mm -hmm. you know and and also it helps you to predict the person's uh, actions mm -hmm. so you can actually build build a predictive model using human uh, data mm -hmm. um, and predict the likelihood of a of a person of being a good citizen let's say right in the in the p parameters that you have set for for the society it's like mm -hmm. a a mass experiment that they're doing um and i don't agree with it but i can understand why they need ai mm -hmm. just because they would not be capable with with human force to run these kind of, of of massive analysis and you also have to consider the fact that they need to collect this kind of data right now um yeah sure we have like we've seen with with the snowden case and all others, uh, we have uh, breaches of, of information, mm -hmm. of personal data right. uh, that companies collect mm -hmm. for us without our consent. Um, but in the same time, uh, we don't actually share the private data that is happening outside the smartphone or the tools that we use. So it, if you put everybody in the mountains and you disconnect them from mm -hmm. technology, nobody will know what's happening there. Nobody. Right. It's a, complete, it's a complete private system. Um, but if you if you do want to get that data, you mm. have to have surveillance systems. And the Chinese surveillance systems is one of the best in the world. So now they have, just to give you a, a bit of understanding, the level of the surveillance surveillance they have. They go beyond China. They have um, contracts signed with partners such as Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, Cuba, mm -hmm. Moscow, Moscow, mm -hmm. Russia is using their surveillance system. So mm -hmm. these are they're trying to to you know actually to uh, spread their surveillance systems because it's so good. Mm -hmm. And societies that are chaotic and based on you know civil wars and that they need this kind of surveillance system mm -hmm. because everything is out of control. Um, there's this is the the main concern of a of a decentralized system is the, the chaos that could take that that could happen inside of not having a central authority mm -hmm. and this is why I believe um, I don't I don't think knowing how how we are as human beings and, and our uh, you know our our mindsets and and our behavior and patterns uh, I don't know if we could actually survive not to say live but actually survive in a fully decentralized world because mm -hmm. if if i go on the street now and i tell one person you are free to do whatever you want um they will either not know what to do or they would get an over sense of freedom and mm -hmm. they would just go 180 degrees backwards so they could start stealing uh, beating people up just because we take so much in we're not aware but on a daily basis we take so much in so when you give people the freedom they explode they're a ticking bomb mm -hmm. um i think systems like like ipfs can can help just because we we have such an imperfect and incomplete system globally mm -hmm. I've, I've been to 45 countries and i saw what wasn't working in each of these countries mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you notice that we are very different as individuals, but our needs are kind of the same. Mm -hmm. You go back to Maslow's pyramid of needs and you understand that that, that is still going on today. We, we, we have the same needs for safety, security, mm -hmm. you know, um, for resources, financial, um, and that we need better systems that can, can help us um, cover those needs. Because mm -hmm. once you have those needs covered, um, at, at an individual level, you don't have frustrations, you don't have um, things that could go into chaos. 
So then it's much easier to talk to people and have them part of your of your uh, mission mm-hmm. to actually decentralize the systems. Right. I, I think we're in the early stages of decentralization anyway. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that I agree with your point about how a fully decentralized world would, would necessarily lead to chaos because there's, there's a few countermeasures that you can put in place. But right off the bat, just the premise in, in my experience, you know, having lived in China for 12 years and having kind of understood, uh, you know, various aspects of um, different countries like India and human trafficking problems and child slavery and, you know, some of the things that I, that I saw in China, for example, um, on the subway in Shanghai, you would often see, you know, children um, that had uh, had like boiling oil poured all over their bodies and they'd also had their, their hands uh, sm- destroyed with hammers. Um, and, you know, they were being led around by some minder who uh, essentially was using this child to beg for money, you know, on, on the Shanghai Metro. So, um, you know, these are just not things that really happen in in more affluent countries like you don't see that in canada for example right um there are certainly anecdotal examples of child exploitation in canada i'm sure um but typically you'll see that a lot more frequently in places um that that are that are far less affluent right so in in china especially in shanghai it's kind of an interesting example because you have, you know, ridiculous wealth uh, juxtaposed with abject poverty, right? You have dilapidated houses, um, you know, that are, that are run down, that have been there for, for a long, long time, that are basically just shacks, you know, squalor, um, they're slums. And right just across the street, you, you know, like, for example, in Shanghai, in Jing'an district, you'll have uh, um, Park One Avenue, which is, you know, these high rises, these high rise buildings with, with uh, you know, indoor pools and all kinds of wonderful facilities um, where, you know, um, it's like 50,000 RMB or even more now per, per square meter to buy an apartment in, in one of these, these buildings. Um, and, and again, just across the street from Park One Avenue, you'll have a slum, right? So in, in places where you have, you know, a tremendous amount of migrant workers coming from the countryside, um, you'll see people in Shanghai doing things for, for money um, that people in, in Canada, where I'm from, where I am right now, just wouldn't even consider, right? They wouldn't even really even think about that. Um, because there's, it's not, it, there's, there's not, there's a lot less pressure to make money just to survive. And so, um, I, I feel like the primary driver of chaos or of, of things that, um, that we find morally abhorrent, such as, you know, child mutilation and exploitation like that, um, these are these are primarily caused by by poverty. I feel, um, and and I, I'm not sure. Like, if you created a fully decentralized world, where you know uh, nodes on the system didn't necessarily have a, a, a massive disadvantage because they weren't running ASICs, for example, right? So, if you created a sim, a, a, a system where sharing and resharing popular content. Um, you know, and, and was was kind of the name of the game, and um, your computer that you had didn't necessarily have a massive disadvantage, and everyone had an equal opportunity to participate in this network, and and to benefit from from the the rewards of this network. You would create, I feel, um, also a decentralization of wealth, right? Because that's one of the major issues, I think, with with the Bitcoin uh, community right now is I, I feel like, you know, I, I heard a statistic, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but something like less than a thousand wallets or maybe even less than 200 wallets 
control 95% of all the Bitcoins or something like that, some disproportionate centralization of wealth. And again, in the centralized economic paradigm, you, we, we understand that there are 3,000 individuals in the world who own approximately half of the world's resources, right? So um, I feel like this, this income disparity or this wealth disparity is, is what, what primarily causes most of the, um, the violence and the, you know, the, the, the crime and all, all of this stuff. I'm not 100% sure. I feel like decentralization could actually help um, with these issues more than anything else. Again, if you create a system that allows for equal participation, right? If you reduce the barriers of entry so that you don't need to buy, you know, an $800 bit, bit main ASIC miner, um, you know, and then you don't have to spend, you know, 3000 plus US dollars on electricity just to get one Bitcoin. You know, right. If, if we if we really reduce the costs and the barriers to entry to participate in a decentralized network, I feel like decentralization would actually uh, improve um, the, the human condition, you know, um, around the world. That's that's kind of just what I believe. I highly doubt that we will see this um, during our lifetimes, so to speak, um, just because if you look at the um, distribution of wealth in 2008, when, when we went through the, um, the major economical crisis mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, the distribution of wealth today, mm -hmm. you won't see too many differences. Right. If you look at, um, you just uh, go and look at the first email exchanges between Satoshi Nakamoto and the um, the early um, uh, the the pioneers of of Bitcoin, and you see there there was a guy who said, you know, the uh, wealth distribution. And imagine we would reach a point where Bitcoin, one Bitcoin would be worth because he he took the entire amount of wealth and he distributed from the top to bottom and he mm -hmm. said if let's say um so the global uh, wealth in the index is how much is it today like um i forgot the numbers of course anyway let's say that you you take um seven billion us mm -hmm. dollars and you distribute them mm -hmm. And you arrange this distrib distribution on top of 21 million bitcoins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you calculate um, when that happens, when the full distribution happens, mm -hmm. you come to the conclusion that um, one bitcoin would be worth seven billion divided by seven trillion divided by 21 million. Mm -hmm. And you'd say, "Wow, this is the worth of one bitcoin." But actually, what happens is uh, you are taking the existing wealth. You're not considering, you know, what is being added up through time because we're looking at Bitcoin and the distribution of of the coins and the half halving of the of of the um, rewards and so on. So it's, it's going to go on until two thousand one hundred and something, right? So yeah, twenty one forty, I think. Twenty one forty, yeah. So. It's over a hundred years. Right. So nobody's taking into account the equivalent of global wealth uh, by 21,000 at least. They're looking mm -hmm. from the present days or 10 years ago. Right. Um, this is a main issue because here, here's what's, what's happening. It's very hard to um, take one system and just flip it. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Uh, there's a lot of factors that we don't control, a lot of power games that we don't have access to. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of happening behind the scenes. What I do think is if we start with education, build better, uh, better layers of education, mm -hmm. informing people, educating them, giving them access to resources mm -hmm. and technology, yeah. like... So we see, for example, um, let's say uh, green energy 
Mm -hmm. We're taking, um, you know, um, solar energy to remote villages and now they can use a laptop and charge a smartphone and they can have access to information, but mm -hmm. also filtering and making sure that a lot of real information, not fake information is presented to them, either in a, in a raw format or a filtered format, mm -hmm. but valid, true, not fake. Then we can build a better system where we could maybe, let's say, um, dream of a decentralized system that actually helps with poverty and distribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. Because right now you don't have the infrastructure for the distribution of wealth. Everybody's thinking seven trillion uh, and then they flip it and they, they say seven trillion divided by 21 million Bitcoin. Everybody's right. thinking that. Nobody, nobody's thinking, okay, this is an old system. We'll throw it away. Let it be, but what we can build, we can start from scratch and mm -hmm. build step by step uh, a global society that is powered by knowledge, education, real information, and giving people the opportunity to choose. Right. Giving people a choice. And that, that could help build a better world. Right now, for example, um, blockchain, AI, they don't help the, the, the poverty rates that we see in, in Yemen, where mm -hmm. half of the population is starving, is dying from hunger. And I see that I constantly, on a, almost on a daily basis, I, I read and I see uh, pictures and it's just tearing me apart because I can't do anything, even mm -hmm. though I'm so involved in the industry. But what I can do is I can get people together, I can build communities and I can inform people. And I can do my best to be honest and, and teach the world what I, what I know and what I've experienced. So I have validated myself, the mm -hmm. information I I know it's, it's valid from my experience and hope that people are interested in knowing more. I was in Thailand and we had this, this woman and she was a, a farmer from the countryside mm -hmm. uh, wanting to learn more about blockchain and understand how blockchain could help her. Mm -hmm. So with the resources I have right now, I could tell her, well, um, it's like a ledger. Like you did farming and like you do farming in uh, 1000 before Christ mm -hmm. and you could quantify on a ledger, you know, the amount of cows and chicken and wine and uh, resources that you have. But you can also verify if the people that are selling you the seeds to plant are actually selling you seeds and not something else. Mm -hmm. um, you can you have the, you have access to a history and a track record which could actually help you make better decisions in the future. Right. And it can help you accept different kind of sponsorships and payments from all over the world. So you could expand your, your small farm to a global distribution. Mm -hmm. And, and in this regard, uh, if you know, Kiva.org, they do uh, small. I'm not sure. So it's a, it's a company where basically it's a platform where you could, Put like twenty five dollars uh, and loan the money to to a farmer or oh micro loans uh, yes yes okay yeah okay micro loans and they pay you back in two years and guess what uh, the other day I saw that Kiva is hiring a blockchain engineer or a blockchain developer mm -hmm. that means they're considering and they see the potential with these micro loans they see the potential of creating a better system by helping people from developing countries or third world countries mm -hmm. to, you know, just do something to get by the day. Mm -hmm. And blockchain as an infrastructure will help them get better results mm -hmm. or accept different kind of payments because right now they accept PayPal and PayPal is super centralized. Yep. They, they use your data. I, I had a graph from uh, DevCon. Uh, they, the way they use your data is like, they, it's, it's, basically 30, 40 other companies behind PayPal that are pulling your data and using your data the way they want to. Right. There's so many that you can't even tell the names on, on a graph, like a, um, just a, a, a basic 800 X 800 pixels image. Right. So when I see examples like, like Kiva, I know that just because they, they started with something that was closely centralized, they have the community and they see the potential in blockchain, they could do better. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's where I know that blockchain could actually help change lives, not the technology itself, but as an underlayer 
of a bigger picture. Right. No, I, 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 I definitely agree with you. And again, you know, from my perspective, if I look at a, at a technology like IPFS, for example, um, you know, if, if we kind of understand that there are exabytes, if not petabytes of, of latent storage on the internet, like for example, my laptop that I'm using right now, I have 512 gigs of SSD and I'm not, e I'm not even using half of it, right? Um, so if we understand all of the latent storage that currently exists, um, we could basically, with a technology like IPFS, completely disrupt um, you know, any large centralized data store. And when I talk about these data stores, I'm talking about any kind of web 2.0 cloud company um, like Amazon, like, um, like Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, IBM, and then also any kind of web 2.0 service like Facebook, YouTube, any social media platform, um, all, of, all of this data could be completely decentralized over IPFS and the, the, the wealth generation of all of these, these types of, of uh, media channels could also be decentralized, right? Like, so imagine if all of the, um, the revenue that is being pulled in by running ads on YouTube was being shared, uh, you know, that I think they, they take 45% uh, of the ad, ad, ad revenue share, uh, YouTube does. So if that was being shared across not only all of the content contributors, but also all of the content consumers, because they're hosting the data and they're resharing it, right? And they're being paid for that service as well. Um, you know, and, and all of the activity um, from like sharing popular uh, social media influencers over, over your, your, um, your computer, you know, for example, let's imagine Facebook or Instagram or, or all of those, those types of activities being hosted in a decentralized way, you'd be distributing a tremendous amount of wealth, right? And if we look at, uh, for example, Open Bazaar, which isn't 100% great right now, but it's also based on, on IPFS, right? We have, we have the ability to completely disintermediate the need for a company like Amazon, for example. Right. So um, I really I, I really do view IPFS as being particularly disruptive. And, you know, it's it's still in its early stages, but I don't think it's going to it's going to require more than a lifetime um, for, you know, uh, something like like I was describing earlier for for um, distributed systems to to help at least with income inequality by lowering the barriers of access and allowing people to monetize their own hardware. I think that this could happen uh, in the next 10 or maybe 20 years, but it's, um, it's certainly, the, the, the potential is there um, and the technology is fairly proven. I mean, for example, the idea, I was talking to the CEO of Seaberry the other day, and he was telling me that a fully decentralized file system is, is impossible. And, you know, I pointed out the fact that BitTorrent has existed for, what, 20, 30 years already? Um, and, you know, BitTorrent is right off the bat, if you're using magnet links, um, you're, you're sharing all the, the seed and, and peer information over a distributed hash table and there's no central server on the BitTorrent network, right? The only thing that BitTorrent doesn't have is a decentralized index of content. So if you're, if you're trying to find a magnet link for a particular piece of content, you have to go to a torrent search engine, such as, I don't know, let's say legal torrents, or you could also maybe use uh, the Pirate Bay, for example. Um, these are essentially search engines like Google, but specifically for files being ho hosted over the BitTorrent network. But the BitTorrent network in and of itself is fully decentralized. So I feel like this technology is already tried, tested, and true. We just need to add more features to it. And that's kind of what IPFS is. It's just torrents with more features. And, um, 
And so that's why I'm, I'm extremely optimistic about it. I think it could be really the backbone of Web 3.0. I think it could completely disrupt the Web 2.0 industry um, as it is right now. And, um, and, and that Web 3.0 would create a lot less uh, billionaires than Web 2.0, right? Uh, Web 2.0 created things like like Google and and YouTube and Facebook and all these social media channels, um, and it created a tremendous amount of centralized wealth. <clears throat> but Web 3.0 has the promise of sharing all of the revenue um, of equivalent services across the entire network, and everybody could be a stakeholder and everybody could be a, a beneficiary of, of this Web, web 3.0 infrastructure. So that's why, that's why I'm really optimistic about it. I think that IPFS and, and something like Filecoin um, could be just unimaginably disruptive uh, if done correctly. And I'm not sure that it will be, and I'm not sure that it's gonna continue to be funded um, you know, protocol labs. I don't know what their situation is right now, but I'm, I'm in the, uh, the mailing list on GitHub for, for IPFS. And I kind of, I follow the newsletters and I see all the, the commits and everything. And there seems to be some activity, um, going on. So, you know, it is in active development, but you know, I just hope they get there. I just hope they get there because this is an incredibly promising technology. Yeah. Um, there's two aspects here. Um, one is the the cost, so like the resources we need to mm -hmm. fuel this kind of system, um, which I don't find that that much addressed in at least in the the papers that I've read about uh, IPFS and the, um, the the use cases like the what you know companies trying to build on top of the technology, um, and also the security aspect which is very important um i'm gonna be 30 this year and i spent most of my um, elementary school call, uh, high school days online mm -hmm. um throughout 2000 to 2008 and you know if you remember there there was irc channels before and we also had uh, uh dc plus plus networks Mm -hmm. which were the C++ networks were great at sharing information. Right. The whole, you know, distributing uh, music, movies, whatever you wanted. Um, and, and I, from my computer, could upload it to the network and then somebody else could take it. The mm -hmm. only problem, uh, the major problem with DC++ was the security. Right. Because it was very easy to, um, again, to... Uh, you know, have have um, all these uh, viruses and infected files that reach the other person's um, hardware, mm -hmm. so the computer and software. And we're not seeing any kind of improvement, actually. Though it's been almost 20 years, uh, we don't see a lot of improvement in that kind of sense because we still deal with a lot of uh, security breaches um data being stolen um malware making its way into the devices that we use and the systems that we use and mm -hmm. we're very vulnerable so i think it would be also important uh to address the the security of, of the systems that even though they're decentralized um what we build again what we build on top of the decentralized layer mm -hmm. because Blockchain as a as a structure is uh, secure. Mm -hmm. right. um, uh, it's secure, validated, um, block by block, and so on, interconnected, which is fine. But what we build on top of it doesn't guarantee that security. Right. And I was just talking today in another group with with some people about how you know we we all see these stats about. Um, millions of dollars lost through um, exchange hacks, for example, mm -hmm. in crypto. Mm -hmm. But nobody talks about what is happening behind the scenes. The ICOs that lost fund but didn't declare, mm -hmm. the companies that were raising funds, the um, 
fundraising companies that were raising funds and got hacked internally and didn't declare mm -hmm. the tax evasion that happened and wasn't declared because it would generate a whole mess. Right. So actually what, what we find is that we still, we are still very vulnerable mm -hmm. and we don't have yet a security layer, which can guarantee that this, this vulnerability will not become the main weakness of a system. Right. That we want to use to build the web 3.0. Mm -hmm. And it's also important to look at the fact that, you know, uh, trust is given when a user signs up and uses your system mm -hmm. or the moment it, it interacts because a, an intention to act is quantified as an action. Towards mm -hmm. it, right? So when someone signs up for, for your product or service, they already give you the trust. They already mm -hmm. trust you. But loyalty is earned. Yeah. And what mostly happens with hacks, for example, with security breaches, we see that the user, the consumer, the human side is constantly affected and they let go. They don't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. People are very sensitive when you take the trust for granted and you don't do anything uh, towards it. Mm -hmm. So a part of the decentralization is ensuring that the trust that is given in these systems mm -hmm. stays and is actually increased and not decreased which ultimately transforms into loyalty so right. we're building trustless systems okay but they are not loyalty less systems mm -hmm. you still need the loyalty on top of trustless systems and right now i don't see any kind of of action taking in into that direction of making sure the loyalty says we, we want people to use blockchain. We want mass adoption. We are not doing a lot of things into loyalty, building the loyalty. Mm -hmm. That's why I say, I think we have, if we take it step by step, um, we have so many things to fix and mm -hmm. improve in the way. Um, and we'll have, ultimately we'll have to decide, do we use the old systems improved and upgraded or do we build from scratch? Because, you know, you, you said about Web 2.0, um, it's very interesting that in, in the 90s, um, Microsoft and later on Google, uh, they had access to Alta Vista, especially Microsoft, they had access to Alta Vista databases. Mm -hmm. So at this point, uh, there is no uh, public database available on what users search for and their user behavior on search engines. There's nothing like that. And I highly doubt there will ever be because theoretically speaking, this is private information, but you know, it's a business. So it's kind of means giving the fuel for free. Mm -hmm. um, in the nineties, they were analyzing, they were doing these, Microsoft was doing these, these workshops, pay mm -hmm. workshops, where you could get to, to work with a chunk of data from Alta Vista search engine. So maybe 150,000 uh, search queries and you could work with them and analyze them. Um, and back then, 1998, 1999, they were already thinking and prospecting for web 2.0. Mm -hmm. Back then, before you had social networks, before you had, just because they had access to the data. Right. Um, I think it's important to have access to the data uh, willingly given by people. Because right. that means that you can actually predict with a 99, 95% or 99% uh, trust level, conf um, confidence interval that um, it, you're actually moving towards the society that you want. Mm -hmm. So this is just, you know, because you were mentioning so much about Web 3.0, I think um the the some of the data is there since the 80s 90s and 2000s but we are not seeing it um kind of used to its full potential to actually understand where we can take action immediately and where we can build uh right now all of us in this industry we're just trying to figure out and we don't really have the direction mm -hmm. we don't have the direction we 
we take multiple paths and we're trying to reach a point and it's going to be really difficult to reach that point just because the destination is not set. Right. I mean, personally, I, I, I feel like, you know, as a user, um, if I was using a decentralized index of content or, or, you know, a decentralized version of, of Google search or DuckDuckGo or whatever, I wouldn't necessarily have a problem um, publishing my search queries uh, as long as they were anonymized, right? As long as they were not personally attributable to me. Like it wasn't, it's not necessarily that I made these searches. It's, it's someone uh, in my neighborhood searched for, for this topic, for example. I feel like I, I would be mostly okay with that. Um, especially if it allowed for the creation, again, of um, algorithms running on my machine, right? Um, machine learning algorithms that are optimized on my machine that can search a fully decentralized index of content um, in a way that, that, is, that is optimized for me personally, rather than being optimized for Google's revenue model, right? So for example, if you're, if you're using Google, um, you're using a private, uh, opaque algorithm. Um, you don't know what the algorithm is. You don't know how it ranks search results. You have no idea. You're, you're just essentially trusting that Google is trying to give you the most relevant results based on your search query. But this is not necessarily the case, right? Um, they, they can definitely be optimizing for, for their business interests, which does not, which in ways that do not necessarily align with the interests of their users. So I feel like even the decentralized, the decentralization of, of um, you know, these, these uh, databases, if done correctly, if anonymized, um, I feel like that's okay. And I know that Apple uh, is, is working in this, in this space. Again, they, they have a centralized data store, um, but, um, you know, Siri search queries that are uploaded to Apple um, and, and contribute to their, their data set are anonymized. They're not personally identifiable. So this technology, again, it, it does exist. It can be done. It's not, it's not um, a miracle to develop this technology. It's all, it already yeah. exists today. So, so it's, just, it's just a question of can we open source it and can we distribute it and decentralize it? And you know, when it comes to security, I feel like, like imagine if you had some kind of IPFS uh, based uh, operating system, right? IPFS OS. And um, every time that there was a security patch, the, the, the code for that patch, instead of, for example, if you're running an Apple device, um, when Apple pushes an update, you're not seeing source code, right? You're seeing, you're seeing a pre-compiled executable that Apple pushed to your device that you're just gonna run. And the same is true on, on Android, and the same is true even in, in the Linux community. 99.9% .9 of Ubuntu users are not looking at the source code for the security updates that they're running on their machines. So what would be interesting would be to see a decentralized file system where people could um, patch security vulnerabilities in real time and then push the source code to the communities. And then you'd have, you know, um, a developer community in, uh, you know, running on top of, of the IPFS network that would have the opportunity to actually look at the security patches and rate them and see if they're creating, you know, side effects or, or other vulnerabilities. And then these developers could all rate the security patches and then they would have kind of a reputation score that would also be transparent to the network. Um, and then your computer would essentially be receiving eventually like a vetted piece of source code that you could then compile or you know if it's an interpreted language like python you could just run on your system um and um you know you would not only be receiving source code you would be receiving confirmation 
that it's been it's been viewed and vetted by let's say uh, a thousand developers um, with with very high reputation scores on the network people that that actually know what source code is and how it works and that they've they've vetted this source code and they think that it's it's good so they've they've approved it right so you'd be receiving security patches in the form of transparent source code that has been transparently ap approved by a reputable network of of developers so you know um i i feel like even the security aspects um could be enhanced over a fully decentralized network like even on github for example and i'm not saying anything bad about github github is is great you know it's a, it's a free resource where you can upload source code and and whatnot but because it's centralized i mean when you're downloading a release a pre-compiled build of some open source software on github again you're not seeing the source code you can look at the source code but how do you know that the the executable that you're downloading right if you're just a user like me how do you know that that executable is actually based on the source code um, that is listed in that repository, right? Um, again, when it comes to Android, Android is supposedly open source. Um, I wonder how many, how do you know that your, your OEM, your original equipment manufacturer, be it, you know, Huawei or, or uh, Xiaomi or, you know, Samsung or, you know, even Google, how do you know that the version of Android that they've pre-installed on, on your device is actually based on the exact same source code um, that, is, that is open to the community? And how do you know that it hasn't been modified in any way, um, you know, to optimize their, their private for-profit interests or that it hasn't been you know modified um maliciously for for the purpose of you know state level intervention and surveillance um built into your device you know like you 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 really have no idea so when it comes to these decentralized networks um i feel like there's there's the potential for them to offer any a much greater amount of transparency as well yeah I agree. So, so I'm optimistic I, about that. Yeah. I use Huawei. <laughs> you use Huawei, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And they have two systems. They have the um, Android and they have their own system, which is mm -hmm. powered by Emmy. So you can say hello, Emmy, and she does stuff to you. Mm -hmm. And the, well, the package is MUI. Whenever there's an update, mm -hmm. uh, you can check. If, it, it gives you a, some timestamp uh, and just keyworded, um, pack, packaged keywords, mm -hmm. what, what they've updated and what they did. Right. So a, a change log, uh, basically. Yeah, yeah, a change log. Um, you don't really, this is the thing I've never really understood if, when there's an update, if the update from android comes from a specific source or is it sourced from the company that you know released the phone and created the additional um, uh, operating system on on that phone you, you don't really know this right uh, it's not public and um, you don't have a, a roadmap of the the code right you don't have a, a roadmap to follow the code and to see if if um, this company has released like this is the point where it all started and just like a neural network right yeah you can understand where a it's tree going. yeah a tree yeah you don't have the tree um and i think um but with with blockchain you have the tree because you have the genesis block the first one mm -hmm. so then you understand where it's going and the initial source mm -hmm. so it's I far more transparent easy. yeah yeah Exactly. That, that's where the transparency happens. Just because you can actually, if you would spend a lot of time, you can, you can track. That's why Bitcoin is not 100% anonymous because theoretically speaking, you can track up, up to the, the last, the, the first block, not the last, but the first block. Right. Right. 
Well, there are some things that you can do with tumblers and mixing transactions and, and you know, interesting implementations okay. uh, over the, Bit, the Bitcoin network and also using Lightning Network, which is off-chain transactions and stuff, routed transactions. You, you can anonymize it if you want to. Um, and also, uh, there's, another, there's another cryptocurrency called Dashcoin that has, um, uh, not Dashcoin, uh, Z, Zcash. Z, uh, Zcash or Zcash um, that has um, zero knowledge proofs. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be anonymized, but but it can also be transparent, right? So this having distributed databases that that are replicated, th this technology goes back to the concept of conflict-free replicated data types, right? It's basically instead of having one centralized data store. Um, maybe with a few backups, it's it's a way of of sharing a database and replicating a database and verifying the integrity of a database across millions of systems. So the transparency that you get from such a network is um, is very very useful, especially when it comes to um, to the the you know its potential for enhancing the security of software over distributed. Uh, software repositories and distributed software updates. I think I think that could that could also be uh, yet another amongst the many disruptive elements of this technology. Yeah, yeah. There are, um, like I said, there are processes and there are things that are happening, um, and it's amazing to know that technology is backing us up mm -hmm. um, these days. Um, I remember the times when I had to manually install uh, Windows uh, 98. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, use a floppy, floppy disk and uh, look through all the, ma like manually um, add every kind of driver uh, and update it. We've, we've definitely come a long way. Um, you know, it's just, we'll just have to see as uh, human beings where, where we can take this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm a huge huge believer in the technology, and I'm like I said I'm also a believer of community backing technology up because we're we're basically in, in the crypto space and in blockchain where we're a small community of people who actually understand uh, where this could go to, mm -hmm. and we feel the pain we experience it. So it, it comes from experience. It's not something that we imagine. The only problem is right now we're mostly creating a solution. Uh, for a future need, not for an existing need. Right. This this is where we have to. We are creating something in hope that will be used someday, not uh, addressing uh, the immediate need. This is where we're we're losing ground. But I think uh, throughout the years, next couple of years, maybe three, four, five years, we'll see this 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 step being taken care of. Mm. Well, I mean, the immediate need, um, you know, if, if you look at a technology, um, you know, any kind of content distribution network that is censorship resistant, I mean, can benefit people in mainland China, in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, in, many, in North Korea, right? If, if for example, um, just the BitTorrent network, for example, if, if you're you know, using a BitTorrent client that's um, accessing, you know, mainline DHT or Kademlia that has, you know, 20 million or so peers, all running, mostly all running behind dynamic IP addresses that are constantly changing, right? Try writing a firewall rule that's going to block 20 million dynamic IP addresses, right? It's this, this, this technology could uh, be immediately useful to one, you know, 1.4 billion people just in mainland China, and then you know, in the Middle East and in North Korea and in in in, in Russia and many other countries that are kind of repressive authoritarian states, um, and then also the security benefits of obfuscating, you know, who's corresponding with who, right? So. I don't know if you ever saw, there's a really great documentary called A Good American. 
Um, it's about Bill Binney's work at the NSA and how he was a lot less interested in the individual content of correspondence, right? Like, like listening to what people were saying on an individual phone call um, was, is a lot more resource intensive, right? You have to have a human being listening to a recording of each conversation. But when you just look at, for example, the dates that a phone call was placed from one phone number to another, the dates and times, the duration of the calls, the frequency of calls, you can see like if you identify uh, who is a member of, of some network that you think is problematic, right? Um, you identify one of these individuals, you can then see what the relationships are, right? And you can see like, for example, this person is receiving, let's say one phone call a day from this network. Um, but there's someone over here in the same network that's receiving, you know, 500 phone calls a day, right? So maybe the person um, that's receiving a much greater volume of calls is, um, is like some kind of influencer or, or you know, um, kind of head, some kind of uh, top lieutenant in this network, right? So you can, you can start to identify who um, the, the, the major targets of opportunity are just by looking at metadata. So if, if you're having a decentralized network, this could be um, very beneficial and very useful for, um, for journalists and for, for people who could be viewed by a totalitarian regime as some, some kind of terrorist or, or, you know, like in China, you know, the Chinese government probably views human rights activists as, uh, as um, to them, they're terrorists, right? Because they're disrupting the harmony uh, of their political system. So um, there's a name for that. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I, I, I left the academic research space because uh, we are so obsessed with uh, the uh, bell curve and the meme and the um, meme distribution that mm -hmm. we and and to as as a researcher you want to you're biased because you you're not looking to um, test your hypothesis you're actually looking to validate it mm -hmm. okay uh, you're always looking to get positive results and validate and say it's accepted it's real. You're not looking to, so and in this sense, you're, you're analyzing data that is normalized. You're not looking at outliers. Mm -hmm. And what you just said about people being influencers and having specific uh, behaviors that don't fit the pattern, mm -hmm. they are the outliers and they are the ones that we should switch the attention to because they are very rich in information. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of information from, from regular users. So right. from the mean population these are the people that are different mm -hmm. and they have an, a lot of data for being different mm -hmm. um, and you don't see that this um, really considered um, you see in like uh, it seems like China um, you know in communism outliers will or, or all the time suppressed mm -hmm. because we're looking to normalize the data you know mm -hmm. make everybody equal but we're not looking to uh, test the outliers and people who don't fit the pattern right. and understand why and what is there. So, and unfortunately, we've this was carried on in, in academic research as well. Um, and I think there's um, a lot of insights that we constantly ignored in hundreds of, of tests that we did. Um, I built an IQ test for the Romanian population. So I've, I've had 20,000 people take my, my test mm -hmm. to validate the model and come to a, a, a model that kind of works. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I was always forced to let go of the outliers, of the people who had maybe a, a, a different, uh, um, different way to rationalize things and understand mm -hmm. a different understanding, and I couldn't quantify them. Mm. Uh, and I couldn't do anything with them. I just had to get rid of them. Okay. Yeah. That's... I, think, I think, you know, one of the, the reasons why I, I like this industry, the, the blockchain space, is because we are building something on top of the outliers. 
uh, people that are different, you know, people that don't fit the norm, um, people that want better systems and people that want new systems and they want uh, governance uh, and they want voting rights and they, they, they want something different. So this, this framework that is coming to be as blockchain is basically built on, on outliers, on the mass amounts of data that doesn't fit the, the normal the normality that we were used to. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, I mean, when it comes to, um, to outliers, I, 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 if, if I was an outlier, I'd rather have anonymity, right? I, especially in, in, um, in most countries. I mean, like in mainland China, again, if you're, if you're an outlier, um, you're, you're kind of, um, you know, they, they, there's an old Chinese proverb, the nail that stands out gets hammered, yeah. right? So um, technologies that can obfuscate your kind of outlier tendencies um, over decentralized network and that can kind of anonymize the metadata uh, of your, of your um, or obfuscate the metadata of your correspondence uh, could be very, very useful just from a human rights perspective, I, I think, you know, so. Yeah, we just have to consider that the, the nail that stands out, stands out because it's, it's different and it's perceived as different. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, so someone has to pay the price mm -hmm. before we can go to uh, an anonymous movement, an anonymous system. Someone mm -hmm. has to pay the price and initiate and stand up and say, this is not right. This is not okay. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's a different way. These yeah. are thought leaders. These are people, you know, and I'm really happy to see we have a lot of, of smart people in the industry uh, with uh, technical knowledge and even developers that stand up and you know, make, make a stand and always repeat the message. Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, I, we've been talking, I think, for like well over two hours now or something like that. Um, an hour and a half. <laughs> an hour and a half? Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, was there anything else that you wanted to cover? I remember before the, the chat, you mentioned that you had some statistics that you wanted to talk about. Um, oh, yeah. This was, um, you know what? I can share, I can actually share with you um, if people will watch this. Uh, I can share with you the presentation I had. Um, or parts of the presentation that I had at uh, this conference, this developer conference in mm -hmm. November. Um, it was more, um, you know, as an encouragement. And there were some stats from, from IBM about um, expand, expanding uh, intelligent IoT, like IoT power by merging with AI. And um, I think think it, it gives a lot of input on the, the current situation also with, with blockchain. Um, so there was 19% uh, reinventors and the reinventors is someone who strategizes plans and uses and actually does, uh, you know, implement um, high tech. And then 31% tacticians um, connecting the sensors and few plans to actually uh, do something. Uh, the aspirationals who are ambiguous and would like to do something but are not really sure and then the observers uh 38 percent observers looking from the sidelines and if we if we were to apply this, this is a research from ibm if we were to apply this this uh, uh statistics uh mm -hmm. like this, this pattern to blockchain we would kind of have the same numbers we'd have 19 percent of people who actually invent reinvent innovate and then we have 38% uh, that are tacticians, people that just talk and do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have 13% um, people that aspire to try it at some point. Mm -hmm. And then we have the majority um, observers. So and I think we're still on the stage. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's you know, very consistent with kind of you know the, the the movement of early adopters and late adopters and 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 so on yeah i mean most people don't really want to give up something that works better um for something that's that um 
doesn't really work very well and it's it's less convenient right like early adopters are usually enthusiasts um, that really really care about a technology and late adopters are people who who join in once everyone else has already joined in and 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 not being in the network is actually kind of exclusionary so um, you know I just I just hope we can get that network effect with with these technologies oh I think we're we're getting there I'm, I'm positive that we're getting there mm -hmm. um, just uh, we have to accelerate a bit and like I said um, knowledge is power yeah the more, the more you get to know about systems and uh, um, the, the more samples and examples you have with the current system uh, versus the the future <clears> system, <throat> the more people will will jump into it mm. and stay there because <laughs> that's that's what we want we want people who who jump into it but also stay there right i agree and keep them. cool <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks for your time. I, I, th I thought this was a great, uh, a great conversation. I appreciate all your insights. And um, anytime you want to do it again, let me know. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.